Hello everyone, my name is Mark Darwin Sayed and for this group discussion, I will be presenting the types of speech community. In this presentation, you will see various video contents showing how the specific accent is posed. English is the most widely spoken language in the world, having the distinct status of being the official language of multiple countries. While the English language is uniform with major variations in spelling present between American English and British English, the dialect accent is usually the factor that enables one to distinguish the various types of English out there. Like most languages, there are varieties of English too, however, the difference is not as prominent as you may see in other languages. So here are the kinds of English and their characteristics to be discussed. We have the British, the American, the Australian, Canadian, Indian, Philippine, and Ugandan English. And so British English is the English language as spoken and written in the United Kingdom or, more broadly, throughout the British Isles. Slight regional variations exist in formal written English in the United Kingdom. And so most people in Britain speak with a regional accent or dialect. However, about 2% of Britons speak with an accent called Received Pronunciation, also called the Queen's English, Oxford English, and BBC English, that is essentially regionless. It derives from a mixture, mixture of the Midlands and Southern dialects spoken in London in the early modern period. It is frequently used as a model for teaching English to foreign learners. And in the Southeast, there are significantly different accents. The Cockney accent spoken by some East Londoners is strikingly different from received pronunciation. The Cockney rhyming slang can be, and was initially intended to be, difficult for outsiders to understand, although the extent of its use is often somewhat exaggerated. And here is a sample video clip of received pronunciation and Cockney accent respectively from YouTube. where we shall renew and extend the friendships which we value so very highly. In the early part of the year, we shall visit India and Pakistan on the invitation of the presidents of those countries. And I welcome especially this opportunity of seeing for the first time something of these two great nations of the Commonwealth. My government will play their full part in maintaining the North Atlantic Alliance and the other regional pacts to which they belong. My armed forces will continue to make their contribution to the safeguarding of world peace. The friendship which links us to our great ally, the United States of America, is a powerful element in the defense of peace. Throughout the coming session, my government will continue to give resolute support to the work of the United Nations. The improvement of relations between East and West remains a primary object of their policy. In particular, they will go on working for the success of the Geneva Conference on the discontinuance of nuclear weapons tests and will do their utmost to achieve comprehensive disarmament under effective international control. They will continue to cooperate with their partners in consolidating the European Free Trade Association. And here is the Cockney accent. I'd like to talk about the Cockney accent. This is the traditional accent of working-class Londoners, 
and many Cockney speakers have now moved out of the capital to places like Essex and Kent, but you'll still hear this accent from many black cab drivers in London. One of my students recently showed me a clip from the television show EastEnders. This is a soap based in the East End of London and many of the characters speak with this Cockney accent. I'm going to show you a clip, see if you can understand it. Ah, shout all you like, you ain't gonna see her! Did you understand? I'll play it again. Ah, shout all you like, you ain't gonna see her! I'll play it again twice, but in slow motion. If you want to listen again, then go back, because I'm now going to give you the answer. What she's saying is, shout all you like, you ain't gonna see her. Or a more formal translation would be, you can shout as much as you want, but you are not going to see her. Let's look at how this breaks down. First, the word shout. In my accent, the vowel is a diphthong. Ow, shout. But in her accent, it's a monophthong. And then she finishes the word with a glottal stop. It's not a t, a t sound. Shout, shout. Notice that the word you becomes y, and the vowel in the word like starts from a much further back place compared to in my accent. You like? You like? In the second part, we have ain't, which is an informal way of saying are not. We have gonna, which is a contraction of going to, and we have the word her pronounced without the H and without the R. You ain't gonna see her. You ain't gonna see her. Let's listen again to the whole clip. Ah, shout all you like, you ain't gonna see her. Hopefully you can now understand what she's saying. Have you ever had trouble understanding a Cockney accent? Comment below and let me know. Cats like ah. <laughs>
They say like. Colorado doesn't really have a typical accent. Lots of people say that it has no accent, but you'll definitely get called out if you say Colorado. It's Colorado. So I've been told from people in New York that my state has an accent. Some people go Chicago. I don't think we do. There's parts that I can hear like a little bit of a twang and kind of sound like this. Some people in New Mexico have accents, depending on what part of the state you're from. People in the South tend to sound a little bit more like they could be from Texas. Really wide syllables, really kind of drawn out phrases. It's a little sing-songy, like a little bit valley girl almost. I'm from New Mexico and I love eating burritos. You wanna go skiing up on mountain? Pass me those taters. <laughs> I don't know, I mean like there's cowboys. You know, there's horses. I don't know, because I don't feel like I have an accent. I went home a couple of years ago and was watching home videos of my sister and I, and we had to like do a weather forecast as like little kids, and we'd be like, there's a big hurricane coming from the, the left coast, but don't worry because we don't know that it's coming. And people would be like, what are you saying? I can put on the, you gotta park the con hop, you gotta give the god a quarter for some chowder. That's a standard Boston accent right there. Any ER would have an AH at the end. It's kind of like, Boston, but cooler and a bit more drunk. Like, we gotta go up to Baja, but I get some lobster supper. My mom has this kind of strange, half French Canadian, half Boston accent that sounds like peanut characters. Oh, if you're from North Dakota, you've got some long O's. Oh, yeah, you betcha. Yeah, hang on to your R's a little, too. It gets a little bit thicker the older you are. Your grandma sounds a little bit like this. Your mom might be a little bit softer. I'm from Wisconsin. Go pack, go. It kind of gets like up here. Go pack. I say bag. I have some eggs and a big. The best example of the Wyoming accent I feel like I've ever seen was in Brokeback Mountain. One curve in the road, and they missed it. So if you live in Washington State, no one ever says they have an accent. They all think they speak pretty normal, which is kind of true. Just kind of middle of the road. Sort of like Delaware itself. But they also kind of have like a country hit kind of thing to them. So they'll say like, Washington, Like, I'm gonna wash my hands. And you're like, wash? What kind of a word is that? We pronounce our T's as D, so we say like Connecticut instead of Connecticut. I feel like Michigan's typical accent um, is very nasally, hi, like that type of vibe. So if I'm from like Northside Kauai, I'm going to sound something like this. People say that us Marylanders have accents, but I don't think we have an accent. Idaho doesn't have a really distinct accent. There's no accent in Indiana. This might be very biased, but I don't think we, I really don't think we have an accent. I don't hear it, but I get reminded of it when I travel. I mean, I, I think this is normal. It's a perfect neutral Pacific Northwest tone. Sarah Palin does not have a typical Alaska accent. She's not really from there. She grew up in, I don't know, Kansas or something. My husband laughs at me because I say wolf instead of wolf. Our accents are all over the place. The first one that comes to my head is a Latino one. Me voy a coger un cortadito. <laughs> There's the St. Louis accent where we say certain things like quarters and water. Where I'm from, they like to say Haina or Mayan. That shirt over there is Mayan. From Philly, they like to say wooder and use guys, but in Pittsburgh, instead of use guys, they say yins. What are yins doing? North Carolina is, is it's, it's an interesting accent. It's just got a little bit of a drawl. It's a little lazier. Just very slow pace, very good, very nice. There's Tross in South Carolina, which is more like this. It's more smooth. Might have a daughter named Darcy. And then you got the real squealy, squealy southern accent. And then you just got the very just, hey, how you doing? God bless. You have some good day now. Okay. <laughs> what is that to us the different accents of each state of America? So what we have next is the Australian English. And Australian English or Okay, so Australian English is the set of varieties of the English language native to Australia. 
Although English has no official status in the Constitution, Australian English is the country's national and de facto official languages as it is the first language of the majority of the population. <coughs> so the linguistic features of Australian English Generally speaking, Australian English takes features from both British and American English, so it is generally, uh, it is sometimes considered a combination of the two variations. However, it is important to understand that there are a number of unique features as well, including exclusive vocabulary. For the grammat grammatical feature of Australian English, <coughs> Australian English's reputation as an amalgam of British and American English can be understood more clearly when you look at its grammatical features. For example, in terms of spelling, Australian English most closely resembles British English. The U in is retained in words like color and the ISE ending is used instead of the Americanized IZE suffix on words like realize or realize. Yet, there are plenty of exceptions to this. The word inquire is often used instead of inquire, <coughs> which resembles American English, while the word program is used instead of the British English program with an extra M, -E, M and E. And furthermore, even though the English, British English spelling of labor, L-A-B-O-U-R, is most common, the Australian labor, L-A-B-O-R, party's name, has an Americanized spelling instead. And much like with British English, Australian English has irregular past tense and past participles of words like spell and smell, so they become spelt and smelt respectively. However, like with um, American, like with American English, Australians are more likely to say numbers like 1,100 as 1,100 rather than 1,100. So let's get on pronunciation in Australia. <coughs> Australian English truly takes on a life of its own when it comes to the pronunciation of words and this is why most people with Australian accents sound so distinctive. <coughs> One of the most noticeable features is the different sound for the I in words like night and like. Instead, it sounds like a less pronounced OI. Or for in the word night, it's noid. So, the next slide will show you different Australian vocabularies and how they are spoke. Okay, so let's discuss first the Australian English vocabulary. As far as everyday vocabulary is concerned, Australian English once again shares words and phrases with both British and American English, but also has some terminology of its own. Perhaps the most obvious examples of Australian words which are now recognized in other variants of the language are Outback, used to describe a remote location, and Barbie, used instead of the noun barbecue. <coughs> an example of an Australian-only expression, meanwhile, would be Duna, which is used instead of the word duvet or duvet. Like in British English, Australians say aluminium rather than aluminium and mobile phone instead of cell phone. Australian English also utilizes the words anti-clockwise instead of the American counterclockwise and petrol instead of the American gasoline. The cover on the front of, the, of a car is called a bonnet rather than a hood, while an Australian will typically say 
holiday instead of vacation. So here is now the different Australian vocabs. <coughs> okay, hi. So yesterday I was chatting on Skype with a friend from New York and I know there's a lot of differences in every country has their own language and even like English speaking languages have their own takes on particular words and phrases. But it wasn't until my friend and I were discussing them and you know, comparing different words and stuff that I realized just how many there are. Yes, technically we speak the same language, but there are so many differences, you could be forgiven for thinking it is another language. So here are a few that we were talking about yesterday. When it comes to cars, you pop the hood. We don't call it a hood, we call it a bonnet. And we don't pop the trunk at the back. We don't call it a trunk, we call it a boot. No idea why. What you call a truck, we call a ute, which is short for utility. And with a baby, you know, you put the diaper on a baby. Yeah, we don't call them diapers here. We call them nappies. And what do you put in a baby's mouth? A pacifier, right? Yeah, I think if you said pacifier in Australia, most people would be like, what the fuck is that? We actually call it a dummy. And I'm not kidding, that's it, that's what we call it. You go to the gas station, we go to the service station, which is odd because people don't really get their cars serviced there anymore anyway. And then because Australians are so big on slang, we don't even call it a service station, we just call it a servo. You go to the grocery store, we go to the supermarket. You walk down the sidewalk, we walk down the footpath. You park in the parking lot, we park in a car park. You wear a sweater, we call it a jumper. You call it a soda, we call it soft drink. Which I think originated from like liquor being a hard drink and then your mixers being soft. I guess that's where that came from. But we don't really call it soda. Oh, and then there's your shopping cart, which we call a trolley. Oh, there are so many. Oh, and uh, what you call a cookie, we call a biscuit. And that's even more confusing because what you call a biscuit is what we call a scone, except we don't pronounce it scone, we can pronounce it scone. Well, we actually spell it the same, S-C-O-N-E, but it sounds like S-C-O-N, scone. Think Tron. Mmm, scones while watching Tron. I'm sure there are millions of others. And then there's like England and they've got a whole nother set of words and phrases and stuff all together, which I don't know about. But it's fun. I like the differences and stuff. But what I think's funny is like, you know, in Australia, our media is all American really. Like we get a lot of American TV and all the movies are here and like the music and everything. So we fully understand the American English language. You know, what I was talking about before, you talk about cookies and diapers and pacifiers and you know, all that stuff and we know exactly what you're talking about yet. I think if we like went over to like New York and just started talking our regular Australian English language, talking about dummies in a baby, wearing a nappy, after you, you know, put all the junk in the boot of the car, you'd be like looking at us like, what planet are you from? Oh, and wouldn't you know it, the camera died right there. But that's okay, I was pretty much done anyway. So what I want to do is I want to tag a couple of people but I don't know how to do that or what that really means. First person is Roland. In okay, so that's it for the Australian English. Let's get on to Canadian English. Now, Canadian English is the set of varieties of English native to Canada. <coughs> According to 2011 census, English was the first language of approximately 19 million Canadians or 57% of the population. The remainder of the population were native speakers of Canadian French. So the term Canadian English is first attested in a speech by Reverend A. Constable Geeky in an address to the Canadian Institute in 1857. So Canadian English is the product of waves of settlers from Britain and France and British and Irish immigration over a period of almost two centuries. It also is influenced in by part uh, it also is influenced in part by languages of the First Nations people with some extra words from their languages being added into the vocabulary. The first large wave of permanent English-speaking settlement in Canada, and linguistically the most important, is from the original settlers from Britain, who claimed Canada as British territory. Another influence to the language was the influx of British loyalists fleeing 
the American Revolution, chiefly from the Middle Atlantic states. The last wave that greatly influenced the language was from Britain and Ireland when people were encouraged to settle in Canada after the War of 1812 by the governors of Canada who were worried about anti-English sentiment among its citizens. Also, to a lesser extent, the <coughs> language was somewhat more also influenced in uh, somewhat more so influenced in pronunciation in the Maritimes to that Hiberno English due to the Irish potato famine, which had massive immigration from Ireland to the Atlantic coast areas of Canada and the United States. Quite recently, people in Canada are preferring Americanized versions of some words such as color being spelled as C-O-L-O-U-R. <coughs> so like any other types of English, they also have distinguishable accents, which I will play next. So by far the most commonly received comments I get on my videos fall into one of three categories. Something about my hair, something about my mustache, or something about the way I say this word. I say about, most North Americans say about. To figure out why, let's take a fascinating look at the world of Canadian accents. The way I talk is a particularly strong example of what people who study this sort of thing call the Canadian raising phenomenon. This refers to the weird way many Canadians pronounce the ow sound in words like house and down and ruined and south. Ugh, it even sounds annoying to me. The idea is that Canadians have a tendency to raise their tongues in their mouths when they make ow sounds, as I just did right then when I said mouth, instead of mouth, which is when you keep your tongue down lower in your mouth. Mouth, 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 mouth. Not all Canadians speak with Canadian raising, and certainly most don't do it as much as I do, but it is a pretty common phenomenon, as you can see in this montage of clips of random Canadians talking I've assembled. Are all very unhappy about this. I am absolutely uh, unhappy about it as well. Just trust stupid, but don't worry about it, because here's what's going to happen. We're going to get drunk and eat chicken fingers, me, you, and the old man. is going to be here in about 20 minutes. A matter of planning, and of course, being a mom is all about routine. Well, think about it. Ten years <laughs> ago, no the price of gold was maybe $300 an ounce. Oh. So you see, some Canadians say it about, some Canadians say it more like about, some people say it somewhere in the middle of those two, and of course lots just say it the normal way, about. But what's weird is that I feel a lot of Canadians are very inconsistent about this. I get a lot of teasing from my fellow Canadians because I say about instead of about, but I notice a lot of people say root instead of route, and no one seems to care. I blame South Park, which made the whole about thing this big funny joke. The first is about taking our citizens. It's about not censoring our heart. It's about, it's about, what's so good? Funny. and made life tough for Canadians like me, who now seem very obnoxiously stereotypical. There is more to Canadian accents than just the pronunciation of one word, however. Like any country, Canadian accents vary a great deal depending on class and region. Most Canadians are probably pretty familiar with this sort of stereotypical lower class Canadian accent, which is kind of the sort of twangy, you know, right? There's this Canadian comedy rap group called B and Steve, and they make YouTube videos where they sing with this kind of accent, and it's pretty funny, as you can see here. Before we learn to walk, we can cross-check properly. Just rock and plaid jackets. Chainsaws, we operate them right. Fucking A-right we do, bud. We cut our weight in firewood. This is, of course, the same accent that was famously mocked in those Great White North segments of SCTV back in the day. Oh, so that's our topic for today. The Great White North. So, good day. What an education, eh? Now, the most famous regional accent of Canada is the accent of people who live in the far eastern Atlantic provinces of Canada, particularly Newfoundland. This region of Canada was originally settled by a lot of Gaelic-speaking people from Scotland and Ireland, and to this day, their accent still has a sort of Irish twinge to it, as we can see in this montage of Newfoundland people talking. That stay is solid, and he's able to incrementally increase. I mean, you could end up with a minority Harper government. You know, that would be the worst possible thing. If you're looking at crew changes, they depend on moving the crew out of here. Some of those people are three and four days late. When I arrived at the airport, there was approximately three RCMP cars here. And what they were doing here, I had no idea, but I knew there had to be something up. They weren't out here picking up fares. If you've seen the movie A Series of Unfortunate Events, you may recognize this as also being the accent that noted Canadian actor Jim Carrey used when he was playing the sea captain guy. Oh, that there was only my fault. Hey, well, I can't tell you how sorry I is for running into your sister. Like Newfoundland people also have a habit of using a lot of weird Newfoundland slang, which when coupled with their accent can make them really hard to understand, as satirized in this Nissan commercial. This is an X-Trail Bonavista. 
Pick a gander at that pen roof, buddy. If that don't put a gust in your spinnaker, I don't know what would. And look at the wheels on her. Got enough alloy in there to fill a bucket. Now, a lot of French Canadians speak English as their second language, so they obviously have a French accent, but the sort of French accent they have is quite different than the sort of accent French people from France have. In France, people with strong French accents tend to substitute T sounds for Z sounds, so words like this and that and those become this and that and those. In Canada, where French is spoken in a sort of more nasally way, French accents tend to use harder D sounds, so dis and dat and those. See if you can notice the difference. This description might seem unfair for the previous generation, but keep in mind that I am not really criticizing the people. We want four things in the Tron speech. We want to clarify this issue about Afghanistan. It's so important. Uh, it's very important for us. The other one is we have a, a bill. Of course, in this era of television and the internet, more and more North Americans are starting to lose their regional or class-based accents altogether. Researchers now often speak of standard American English or the general American accent, which is this sort of bland, plain accent you tend to hear from newscasters and actors and anybody else who doesn't want to seem exotic or interesting. As more and more young people are taught to believe that accents are something embarrassing or hickish, you're starting to see entire generations speak exactly the same way. Entire countries, too. Check out this montage of young Canadians and Americans and see if you can tell who comes from which country. If you really want to get in a company that requires more experience, you have a one-up on everyone else that's applying. With what they give us in my program in particular, like we don't get any seminars or anything like that. It's all lab and lecture. And I just try to be as versatile as possible. Uh, whatever the team needs, I try to do it. So if they need me at the five, I'd like to be in the five. I'm in kinesiology and... A lot of kin is mostly memorization, which is what I'm used to, which is what I'm good at. It was a trick. They're all Canadians. Hard to tell, though. Eh? So the video stopped. So let's just move on to Indian English. So for the Indian English, English public instruction began in India in the 1830s during the rule of the East India Company. The India was then and is today one of the most linguistically diverse regions of the world. In 1835, English replaced Persian as the official So English rep replaced Persian as the official language of the company. Lord Ma Macaulay played a major role in introducing English and Western concepts to education in India. He supported the replacement of <coughs> Persian by English as the official language. The use of English as medium of instruction, instruction in all schools and the training of English speaking Indians as teachers. The view of this language among many Indians has gone from associating it with colonialism to associating it with economic progress, and English continues to be an official language of India, albeit with an Indian twist, popularly known as Indian English. For the distinction of Indian English, <coughs> the difference between in Indian English and British English is observed in rare cases as Indian English has been derived from British English most of the times. British literature plays a major role to influence Indian English language. The difference appears most of the time in pronunciation, but spelling remains almost the same as Indians still accept organize O R. G A N I S E and color C O L O U R instead of accepting the American influence of organized and color. So, how many Indians speak English? 259,678 or 0.02% Indians spoke English as their first language. 
It concluded that approximately 83 million Indians or 6.8% reported English as their second language and 46 million, 3.8% reported at it as their uh, third language, making English the second most spoken language in India. So the next slide will show you how Indian accent really sounds like. Hello, my name is Anbu and welcome to uh, my YouTube channel. Um, uh, today I wanted to, uh, you know, introduce the uh, Indian accent to you. Um, I am very well aware that there is a, 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 a big variety of uh, Indian accents. Uh, and not just Indian, there is Sri Lankan, Pakistani and uh, you know all over uh, South Asia there is different accent but I want to introduce to you the South Indian accent. You know I am very uh, interested in accents and I um, you know if you are ever interested in learning the Indian accent um, perhaps you have a you know an acting role where you have to learn Indian accent. This video will cover the basics of the Indian accent uh, so without further ado Let's get straight into this video. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. Let's just address the elephant in the room. You were clearly judging me on my Indian accent, weren't you? <laughs> you know, I'm also passionate about, like, you know, identity and racism, uh, but that is not the topic of today's discussion. Today's discussion is about the Indian accent, and if you follow a, a few simple steps and a few simple rules, uh, you'll be able to master the Indian accent, you know, really easily. Let's start off with the T sound. So the T is, sounds something like this. T. T. Not T. T. So your tongue is actually further back in your mouth. So, for example, if you want to say the word but, in the Indian accent it's but. But. Okay? So not but, but. So let's try dot. It's not dot, it's dot. Okay, so I'm really exaggerating the T here. So try and practice that sound. Yeah, and uh, you then tone it down a little bit. So, dot. Yeah, it. 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 So in the sentence, don't try it becomes don't try it. Don't try it. So once you've practiced that, the next sound to practice is the L sound. So let's take the word table, for example. When we say the word table, we don't actually pronounce the L in table. You've got the T sound, which we talked about earlier, and this L sound. So practice the start, not T, T. And then it becomes table, table, not table. Table. So, can you put the uh, you know groceries on the table, please? The next sound is the W sound. So, British people will pronounce W as W, and so the word water turns into water. Okay. So the W turns into a V, and then the T in water is the sound that we practiced earlier, and then the R is what the last sound is what we're going to practice. So R isn't R, it's R. So water, water. Another word could be Peter, Peter, Peter. I spoke to uh, Peter on the phone. I spoke to Peter on the phone. All right, so I'm, I'm sure you can hear that difference there. And I've tried to break down the particular sounds that sound different. So go away and practice that. And, you know, I might do a part two. Uh, so hit like on this video if you found that video useful. And, you know, this, this video is not intended to make fun out of any accent. 
you know it's purely educational and you know this video is all about if you are wondering what an Indian accent sounds like and how exactly to do one I hope this video helped subscribe to my channel to stay in touch with my latest videos I make videos on uni life London life and traveling as well I hope you have a fantastic Christmas and I'll see you in the next video see you later I will uh, see you in the next video and uh, take care of yourself bye Allow it. Allow it, man. He's, he's done nothing to you, innit? Leave him alone, yeah? Why, why, why are you messing him around for? Allow it. Stop it. That's bait. <laughs> I, I... Okay, so that was the Indian accent. Next is the Philippine English. The Philippine English is any variety of English similar and related to American English native to the Philippines including those used by the media and the vast majority of educated Filipinos. English is taught in schools as one of the two official languages of the country, the other being Filipino or Tagalog. Philippine English was evolved tremendously from where it began decades ago. Some decades before English was officially introduced, if not arguably forced to the Philippines, the archipelagic nation has been subject to Spanish rule and thus Spanish was the language of power and influence. However, in 1899, when the Spanish gave the United States control of the nation, the English language, although initially not favored, became widely used in a matter of years, which was catalyzed by the coming of American teachers. The Philippine English traditionally follows American spelling and grammar with little to no similarity to British English except when it comes to punctuation as well as date notations. So the Philippines has two official languages. Filipino and English, and around 37,000 Filipinos speak English as a first language. However, a little over 92% of the population can speak it as a second language. <coughs> a Filipino accent is often characterized by pronouncing the letter B as B and switching the sounds for the letters P and F. And here is a sample video of the said accent or the said pronunciation. Hey there Spider, this is your boy Mikey Bustos. This video is an in-depth tutorial of the Filipino accent. The first thing to know is there are no F sounds. Palo, Plip, Pak, Filipino, Philippines, Family, Snowflake. No B sounds. Victory, Ban, Bibo, Living La Vida Loca, Golden Retriever, Blog and Blog sound the same. The lack of B probably comes from the Spanish influence when the Spaniards invaded Philippines in the 1500s. That is why many of us Filipinos have Spanish last names like Bustos. My full name is Michael John Yadanto Mangil Pestaño Bustos. Try saying that five times. Also worth noting, there's no TH. It's either D sound like that, this, there, them, breed, or T sound like tick. Teeth beneath T cell, breath. Also, another thing to note is that the Filipino language lacks the he, she distinct pronouns. It's only one in Filipino, sha. That is why many Filipinos sometimes get he and she mixed up. <laughs> Little bit confused. I like Ricky Martin. Her music is very good. Also, because Philippines is a third world, social class even determines the way you speak English. The socialites say words like promise, forever, correct, true, kadiri to death. When I go to Philippines, I love watching TV and all the funny advertisements. Kuya, germs! Hindi ya? Nako, dandrap! Use head and shoulders, kaya head and scalp healthy. 70 pesos lang. People ask me why I am able to speak like this. And I tell them, even though I was born in Canada, I used to speak like this when I was very small. I learned English from my parents. Pero, but, in grade 4, I learned to speak with a proper accent so that I could fit in and the kids wouldn't make fun of me. But, I never lost it. 
Anyway, there are 171 native languages in Philippines. Isn't that incredible? 171 different dialects? Okay, anyway, I am very proud to be Filipino, also known as Pinoy, because we are a very loving people. Yee! So the next time, you cannot make out the accent of your Filipino neighbor, because you know we're everywhere, just refer to this video tutorial. Mabuhay! See you later, heavyweighter! And pakyao for life! That was the Philippine accent. And for the last one, the Ugandan English or pronounced or the Uglish is the dialect of English spoken in Uganda. As with similar dialects spoken elsewhere, Ugandan English has developed a strong local favor. So the speech patterns of Ugandan languages strongly influence spoken English. Uganda has a large variety of indigenous languages and someone familiar with Uganda can readily identify the, <coughs> the native language of a person speaking English. Ugandan speakers will alter foreign words to make them sound more euphonic. So here is how Ugandan people uh, speak English. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Namuli. I'm a Ugandan YouTuber and in today's video we're looking at you only Ugandan if you say these words. So you're only Ugandan if every margarine is blue band. Growing up, that is the only margarine we knew. Right now, there's like prestige. Those are the only two that I know. You're only Ugandan if you call every toothpaste Colgate. Now, you have to be very careful if you're in Uganda and you go to the show and you ask for Colgate and you're given Daily Dent. You're only Ugandan if every van is a taxi because that's the commonest means of transport that we use here especially in Kampala and most vans have been turned into taxis with those blue dots all over them and then what would be termed as a taxi or a cab here is what we call a special hire it was like the uber of those days you're only Ugandan if you call every motorcycle a boda, a boda B, a bajaj, or a judge. All those are names for motorcycles or motorbikes. You're only Ugandan if every petrol station is called Shell. Although right now it seems like Total is trying to take over. But back in the day, every petrol station was called Shell. You're only Ugandan if you call slippers or moja. Now which slippers? I don't mean the pretty fancy slippers. I mean the slippers that we use in the bathroom when we're going to take or have a shower. And even when we were growing up, Umojas had multiple uses. They also used to whoop our butts if we messed up as kids. You're only Ugandan if you call every detergent Omo and every bleach is Jik. I was X years old when I learned that Jik is a brand name and it doesn't mean bleach. You're only Ugandan if you call all spices Roiko or every curry is Roiko. Hands up if you've ever used anything else. I don't know of anything else. You're only Ugandan if you call all bottled water or mineral water Renzori. Now, of course, there are several other brands these days, but back in the day, we only knew Renzori. And even right now, I find it hard to pick any other brand apart from Renzori. You're only Ugandan if all powdered milk needle. Now, I don't even know if there's any other brand that beats Nido, honestly, I've tried other brands, and for me, Nido will always be it. You only Ugandan if you call all shoe polish kiwi. And actually, I used to feel bad when my mom would use any other shoe polish brand to polish my shoes apart from kiwi. You only Ugandan if you call all diapers pampas. You only Ugandan if you call all books pick fair, whether they were counter books or exercise books. Pick fair was it. You're only Ugandan if all school shoes were butter. But funny enough, not everyone was lucky enough to put on butter shoes. But back in the day, butter shoes used to last. 
long one of my cousins i'm sorry for exposing you used to cut her shoes with a knife just so they could buy her new shoes because butter shoes would last so long they would go through fire go through rain go through mud but they would not get old you only you can then if you call all plastics nice now nice is a company that produces different um kinds of plastic like plastic plates cups buckets and all those kinds of things and all plastic items are nice and you're only Ugandan if you call any small car or Corolla a Maika. Then you're only Ugandan if you call all petroleum jelly bustling. And so that's all for the video guys. I hope you enjoyed it and got to know some of these terms that we normally use here. And you'll also be able to decode when you go out and buy things here in Uganda. Learn to be very specific with the brand name. But also this shows you the power of certain brands and how long they have been in the business that even up to this day with all the different kinds that are on the market for example um, the different kinds of margarine that are on the market people would still go for blue band and so it just goes to show you the power of the brand and so yeah that's it for the video don't forget to give this video a thumbs up leave me your comment down below of anything that i've left out let's share i love hearing from you guys and don't forget to share this video to entertain someone out there and don't forget to subscribe of course if you are new and want to join the family and i'll see you guys in my next video thank you so much for watching oh yeah so the ugandan video was really more of their vocabularies and I have noticed that Ugandan also call toothpaste Colgate like we do, we Filipinos do. And so I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much and God bless us all.